Good evening, everybody. My name is Nikos Jilch. I'm an um, economics editor at the Austrian newspaper Die Presse. I've been writing about um, Bitcoin and also blockchain for a couple of years now. Um, I'm very happy to be invited um, to be the moderator of our um, last panel of the day. It's been a very long day, I think a very productive day. Um, and a very special conference. And we want to talk about this and, and um, the different organizations and um, political entities um, using blockchain to basically to do good, to um, reach sustainability goals. What does that mean? What does it look like? What are the chances? And what are the challenges, technical, political, um, and so on? I'd like to intro introduce the panel. First of all, I have to say, unfortunately, Brigitte Lutz from the city of Vienna um, cannot be with us today. Um, she had to cancel. I'm very sorry about that, but we do have a um, um, perfect replacement for her. Um, I'll still start with uh, Shermin, but by now you probably uh, all know her. To my left, Shermin Woshemkir, director at the um, uh, VU Institute for Crypto Economics here at the University of Economics in Vienna. Um, to my right is uh, Julia Moscardelli, finance and monitoring expert at the um, UNIDO also in Vienna. Um, to her right, Jason Slater, her colleague, head of financial management at UNIDO. And then we go the other direction. Um, our special guest, you already know him, he did a very interesting talk today, um, Human Haddad from the uh, World Food Program. And last but not least, Jürgen Schneider from the Austrian Ministry of Sus for Sustainability and Tourism. Um, just to talk about the form of the panel, we're going to um, have a discussion here for about 30 to 40 minutes, then we'll open up the questions. I think by now everybody knows how the questions work. Uh, you, can send, you can send them at um, Slido um, using, using your codes. Um, it's, I think it's a very good system. It's also a very good excuse to use your cell phones during a panel. Um, I will be monitoring the, the, the questions, maybe even add some directly uh, while, while we talk, but we'll be flexible about this. Um, yeah, I, talked, I told the panelists that they can, they can just you know, shout at each other if they want to. We don't need to have that, but if it happens, it happens. Um, Xiamen, without any shouting, um, what's your resume of today? Um, where do we stand? Um, you, in relations to using the blockchain, as I said, to do good, reaching sustainability goals, um, and what are your most important findings of the day? Okay. So, um, yes, we, uh, the, the idea to do this uh, blockchain, we have been, as a research lab, we have been uh, researching um, uh, potential applications, SDG applications, uh, blockchain-related applications that uh, help us reduce uh, or achieve the sustainability goals for six months now. So um, I'm probably the wrong person to uh, ask for findings. Uh, one of the greatest challenges we saw and the reason we, st uh, we decided we're a research institute, we're usually not in the business of organizing conferences. The reason we uh, created this brand called Unblocked and um, we d decided to organize a conference is that we saw that the technology has a lot of potential but the technology is, um, as opposed to what many think, it's not about cryptocurrencies, uh, it's actually governance technology. And it has a lot of potential, uh, but the people uh, creating a lot of startups in the field, they're of, often they're techies, but they don't have governance expertise. And uh, those who have the governance expertise mostly uh, do not understand blockchain, uh, sometimes are even a bit resistant when it comes to technology. Uh, thank God this is changing and what I heard also when talking with you, also uh, especially Austria is on the forefront of having a Digitalisierungsbeauftragte in every ministry, which I really think is good. Um, and, uh, but uh, the communities are still very isolated from each other. So. And the languages of the technologists is very different of the activists, of, uh, of the policy makers, and of those who understand, uh, and also of the researchers who have the data on what does sustainability mean. Uh, and uh, uh, every sustainability goal has their own, its um, own microcosm on themselves. Sustainability is not sustainability, right? Um, so what we try to do with this conference is to be kind of this focal point, this shelling point where people come together and where we have uh, people from different backgrounds talk about their viewpoint either on sustainability on, or s solutions to reach it and what I found 
the most interesting today is that some people came on stage and they're like, we don't know too much about blockchain. I'm even skeptical, but please, uh, um, uh, überzeuge mich vom Gegenteil. How do we say that in <laughs> English? So uh, uh, try to convince me uh, how can we use this technology. And the feedback uh, that I received personally was that uh, it was uh, the curation of that. Uh, it was well done because uh, the speakers were diverse. The the audience uh, could take away had uh, like different perspectives and now they can go home and learn and also the speakers amongst each other I felt were learning but that was my perspective from the limited feedback I got in the breaks um, and uh, I think what was also the feedback I got was that the format was good. Uh, we tried not to fill the day with talks. We had a one hour blocks with three talks and then one hour in between uh, because there is this need for the different experts to talk to each other and to approach each other and I think um, the key takeaway is we will do that again. Perfect. Um, Humana, I want to I ask you please, um, in relation to, to, to what you're doing at the World Food Program um, in regards to blockchain sustainability, those are two very big words. Can you talk about how you started out and where you are today and especially, I mean, who do you call when you want to do something with blockchain? Wow. Um, okay. Since I spoke about it a bit earlier today, I'll try to keep it yes, uh, brief, please. at least the part of what we're actually doing. So this project started in 2016. Uh, we had, or were just about to launch our innovation accelerator out of Munich, and they had an open call for you know people to come up with ideas of how we can do our work better. And for those of you who don't know, the World Food Program's mission is to end hunger, uh, traditionally by giving food directly, and now by enabling people to buy their own food. And um, I was reading about blockchain and I was wondering if we could have an application in our world. So I made a proposal that we use it initially for financial transfers because that's, let's say, the most tested and mature area of the technology because of Bitcoin, but with the hopes to expand it beyond that. So we started with a pilot of 100 people. Uh, in Pakistan, which was scaled up to 10,000 people and subsequently to 100,000 people where we are right now. And it's working quite well for the transfer of these sort of entitlements to the people that we serve. Um, and next step uh, is our hope to use the blockchain as a neutral network to connect various aid agencies working together and often serving the same people and to act as a coordination mechanism without forcing everyone to use the same system. People can use their own proprietary systems, but blockchain would be the neutral glue connecting all of that. And we're at the stage of hopefully launching a pilot with United Nations Women uh, in the next couple of months exactly to explore this. And if that proves successful, then hopefully um, others will join. If that happens, then there's also a massive potential to create uh, digital identities for beneficiaries on the blockchain, not necessarily self-sovereign, but at least blockchain-based identities, uh, which has a particular relevance in the refugee context and for the one billion people or so who don't have documentation and therefore can't access services. And finally, because there was a theme of currencies earlier today, um, if we can manage to sort out some of the problems of blockchain currencies such as volatility, legality, acceptance, that could have a massive uh, impact on financial inclusion because the blockchain accounts will become the bank accounts, therefore connecting the people we serve to digital financial services. So would you say that this is, this is one of the biggest steps um, towards a more efficient system and even opening up new possibilities that you have seen so far? Uh, I would think so. So we've certainly created efficiencies in the work that we do because we've taken on board certain critical tasks that used to be outsourced. And these outsourcing would have to be repeated every country that we go to, every new operation, and that was very inefficient. So by keeping the core now on the blockchain, which can be copy-pasted to any scenario practically, the actual implementation part of any partners you might need to have, such as bank or mobile money companies, can become much simpler. Um, and I think, again, in terms of, uh, so that's all good for efficiency, but I think the coordination and collaboration aspect is equally, if not more important, given the um, 
number of actors that are involved usually to serve the vulnerable in each country? Uh, one of the main um, questions that we're asking ourselves is what are the hurdles? What are the, the challenges that you come across? And you have started in, in 2016, you said. So can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, was there a moment when you said, okay, this is not going to work because I'm, I'm convinced, but I can't convince the others? Absolutely. So I went into this thinking, oh, it's all going to be like, you know, blockchain and technology and all of that. Maybe 10% of the work. And by the way, we work with very strong uh, partners such as Parity Technology or Baltic Data Science um, who, who have made the technological part really easy for us. Um, the hardest part is that change management process, and I'm sure anyone who's worked with any technology really will tell you that same thing. So of course there's the traditional uh, resistance to change. Uh, there are legacy systems, and you know people are comfortable with it, or heavy investments have been put into it. So like, okay, we just spent so much money making this system, why now all of a sudden we're supposed to something new? And um, there's also the aspect of, to a certain extent, preferring to have a proper proprietary system and not necessarily collaborating. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I think that these have been by far, by far the most challenging aspects of the work that we've done. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jürgen, you're the uh, section chief at the Austrian Ministry of Sustainability uh, for fighting climate change. Um, you told me uh, in our preparation that you're not a blockchain expert yet. Um, but I wonder if you if you enter an Austrian ministry and you want you know you set up a, a meeting an outlook I guess uh, um, about blockchain. What's the reaction that you get? Well, um, I will try and see what the reaction will be. Please. <laughs> I mean. Let me first start by saying, um, well, as a civil servant from the Austrian administration, I'm, uh, well, by training I'm a chemist, so um, uh, we're, we're just looking around what's happening around us. And what we are in charge of is, is uh, for preparing for a changing world. And, um, and, and as you all might know, climate change is, will be one of the big game changers globally. I mean, there has been a very recent report by the World Economic Forum, the Global Risk Report, looking which are the largest global risks for global welfare, peace, development, growth, and so on and so forth. And it turned out that I think it's the fifth year in a row that climate change related risks are the largest risks. And um, the, 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 um, the, the knowledge base for that report is, is basically asking so-called world leaders. So, I mean, if, if, you have a big, if you have a big problem like climate change, I mean, there are different ways to scope it. it the, 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 the most natural ways, what most people do, well, many people do, is to deny the problem. The, the second way is to neglect the problem. And the third way, and I hope that's what you learn on, on this university, to manage the problem. And rather to you know change by management and change not by by disaster. And by managing by managing climate risks, what what we are going to see that we have to look at all the fundamental societal systems. We have to look at the energy system. We have to look at the mobility system. We have to look at the built up system, uh, built up environment system. And of course, we have to look at the um, uh, the agricultural and food system. So. That's the long introduction for, for, for getting, getting to the answers. If, if, if we talk about climate change and competitive climate change risks by adaptation and mitigation, it's not always that we, everyone is enthusiastic about it. And um, so we are, what, what, what we basically do is that we try to find synergies with other societal trends. And one of the most strongest trends we are seeing currently is digitalization. And the, the digital revolution, without any question, will bring major changes to our society and it will bring the changes to all the system I've just told you, to the energy system, to the mobility system. Think of autonomous driving. Uh, it will bring changes to the build-up environment. Think of smart homes, smart grips. And it will bring changes to the agricultural and food system. Think, think for instance, of, um, of smart farming. Uh, the most 
the most concrete one, I guess, is is the energy system, and 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 there's been a lot of discussion about what blockchain can do for for change in the energy system. As of now, we have an energy system with very strong centralized utilities like Verbund, uh, EVN, wherever you are in Austria, and that will basically uh, undergo a fundamental change, uh, which will include a decentralization, a dem democratization, and um, and the di digitalization. Uh, that means uh, what we will shift from the producers, consumer paradigm to prosumers, where people produce their own energy, um, sell their own energy, and, and um, uh, that's where blockchain comes in um, as a system for allowing transfers and also for allowing for, for having um, quite good traceability. I mean, one, one of the things we are, we are currently struggling is the so-called guarantees of origin, for, for instance, for electricity, to ensure that the electricity which you obtain is, is from renewables. And um, so that would be all the issues which, which we, we would talk in our ministry about. Um, status 2019, um, what, what you're talking about, is this something that is going to happen regardless of the rules and regulations, or do we have to first change the rules and regulations in order to, to, to facilitate this transformation? Well, in particular, the energy market is, is very, uh, has very strict regulations and very strict rules. For instance, if you have a photovoltaic panels on your roof, you're not allowed uh, to let your neighbors participate from your own production. Because uh, as of now, it would mean that you are by yourself are um, a utility. So what we are currently doing is we are changing the law and, and to allow uh, so-called uh, local uh, renewable energy communities which by themselves locally and, and uh, separated from, uh, from the centralized system are allowed to optimize their electricity use and that will need some regulatory changes, some liberalization. And what we have done, what we are currently doing in the ministry, we are, um, we are offering a grant, and it's not much money, it's five million euros, for allowing for innovative projects, which will also in, include the regulator, uh, which is in Austria, the e-control, um, uh, to find sandbags and to find solutions where we can really try things out without being hindered by, by tough regulations as we have them now. Mm -hmm. And maybe, if I may add to the energy topic, um, so one aspect, in fact, is what you said, decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer energy trading and the necessary regulation. One interesting thing that we saw today in the talks and also with some of the startups outside is a different aspect of um, uh, blockchain and energy is incentivizing CO2 emission reduction uh, through what we call purpose-driven tokens. Tokens that you get from an issuer uh, for when you can prove that you walked instead of taking the car or uh, to public transport um, instead of taking the car. And based on uh, your activity, it can be calculated, changes outside is showing this, um, the, how much your contribution was to um, keeping this public uh, good uh, uh, the, like a clean air intact. So I think this is also, and that might not even need regulation. And, um, and um, I just wanted to mention it as an add-on of how we can maybe faster impact climate change uh, using these use cases that were showcased also today, like hand-in-hand -hand with peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, of course. I mean, if I, if I may add up to this, uh, this question of MRB, monitoring, reporting, and verification, is one of the key issues also in international uh, climate change agreements. I mean, we, we had a big conference last year in Katowice where we agreed on the Paris Agreement rulebook, and one of the most, well, 
most difficult talks was really, uh, you know, if you have a community of 195 states uh, that everyone is convinced that no one plays false and this monitoring, reporting, verification is really, it sounds very technical, but it's in, at, at the center of a global agreement for, for fighting climate change or any other um, environmental issues. Well, I, I, I'm not above admitting that I actually took the car to come here, but I might, you know, next year I might not take it if I get a token for walking. Absolutely. Um, Jason, um, Unido, first of all, um, give us a very, very brief summary of what you do at Unido, and then we'll, we'll immediately jump into how you can, uh, how you are planning to use blockchain. You need No. Better? Um, yeah, so UNIDO is, uh, first of all, the, the UN organization that focuses on uh, industrial development. Um, we're based here in Vienna, our headquarters. We're operating in around 50 or so countries. We're implementing projects though in over 120, total portfolio of around um, $1 billion. And, um, we, we are focusing on industrial development, which if you're just linking it to the discussion this, with the colleague on uh, the Paris Agreement, of course traditionally when you think of industrial development, you think of smoke and chimneys. And here we're going through a huge transition when it comes to creating decent jobs, looking at the sustainable development goals in terms of trying to um, create and job creation. And that has to be now a very important factor is how can you green industry? So I think one of the important areas that we are now looking at in terms of transforming um, our own mandate um, within UNIDO is to ensure that everything has a much more greener aspect about what we do. Um, and in terms of what, are we, what is it that we are looking to do around the topics of, um, of today, um, Unblocked, is how can we mobilize additional financing? And uh, I think we'll come on to some of that in a minute about, because the sustainable development goals, um, there is a financing gap of between three and five trillion dollars. Three to five trillion, that is huge. And the old way of doing business, which is what we had with the Millennium Development Goals, some may re recall those were in existence over 10 years ago, was they failed ultimately because of the lack of financing. And so for me, and we'll talk a little bit about it now, and that's why I'm happy to have Julia with me, is how can we unlock new types of financing? And that's exactly why I think blockchain um, as a tool, um, as a technology can, uh, can support, accelerate um, the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Um, maybe maybe I, I'll, I'll ask Julia because you just said she's the expert in, in, that, in that field. So, so what, what exactly are you planning and where, where do you stand with this? Is this something that we, we can see tomorrow? Is this something that we can see next year? What's happening? Yeah, um, so we are planning and working already on establishing an SDG accelerator fund. And the main purpose of this fund will be to unblock private financing towards SMEs. Why SMEs? Because we think that they have a crucial role into achieving SDGs. And uh, the finance gap is even larger when we look at uh, SMEs. So we want to bridge this gap and uh, by providing technical assistance and uh, facilitating the access to finance for investments that have SDG-related impact. Um, where we see the potential of, of blockchain in this context is um, into addressing other gaps. So the financing gap is only one, but there's also an efficiency gap into how we operate. So we see the potential of the, using this tool into increasing the efficiency and reducing the cost of our operation in order to maximize the impact of our actions. And um, also we, we see the use of, of blockchain into assess, addressing the gap of knowledge. We see a knowledge gap into the financing world and community mm -hmm. on how to assess actually the SDG-related impact uh, of their investments. Uh, we see impact financing rising and how should this be linked to actual achievement of SDGs. And there are some gaps there in terms of we don't have unified standards on how we measure the impact, how we report on the impact, and we see our role into 
helping defining uh, impact measurements and also have a crucial role into the reporting of the impact that's generated and verifying the impact. And blockchain can definitely help us achieving this effectively and increasing our efficiency. So, so what you're saying is that, that not only mo that money goes not just one way, there's also information coming back on what this money uh, actually achieved? Exactly. Um, and is that, I mean, do you have a framework for that? Is, is, you, you mentioned SMEs, right? Um, is, is an investment to SMEs is always a good thing for, for sustainable development goals? Or is, I mean, how does this work? We will map the, each individual project into their related impact. SMEs, uh, investments towards SMEs can have a various uh, impact associated with it, whether it's local job creation or uh, whether it's a circular economy, because it's actually an area we would like to focus on, because uh, there there's another big knowledge gap mm -hmm. on circular economy, because the current financing uh, system is assessing the risk of the investments in um, models and systems that are built on the linear economy. So there's not even the right tools in place into assessing the risk associated with this kind of investment and projects. And that's also a barrier towards financing this kind of uh, economy that is rising. Exactly. Maybe it's interesting to mention that uh, we started uh, together with our partners at the RCE and we want to uh, have more partners on board. We started to develop an impact assessment tool. Um, and I say we started because it's highly complex. On one hand, especially when it's, I mean, you do uh, SDG and tech, so it's not only blockchain. And by the way, a lot of these use cases we saw today, often we say it's a blockchain use case, but especially along the supply chains of goods and services, it's never only just blockchain. It's blockchain, AI, and IoT. It's a combination. It's just that blockchain is the spine of this new decentralized web or Web3. Um, but... Um, uh, so, uh, w on one hand, when defining, like, what does impact mean, first of all, from you have the blockchain-related questions, you know, and, and de uh, developing, uh, or the technology-related questions, developing so, such impact assessment tools, you first uh, have to understand the, the, uh, the technical aspects, and they're like, so, they're like a world in themselves, or various world in themselves, and then on the other hand, you have to understand um, SDGs and the impact that this project, uh, like how feasible is this project from a technological point of view, how feasible is that the team can make it happen, and how what is the real impact? Is that what they are trying to achieve? Really, that what we, what they will achieve, or that what they have achieved? And how do we measure it? And how do we measure it in a, on a long term? And also the interdependencies, um, because um, uh, the world, um, you know, if we only measure like how many trees have been, for example, we've been talking about purpose-driven tokens, tokens that incentivize CO2 emission reduction. Um, Maybe CO2 emission reduction is not such a bad, uh, um, um, good example, but uh, maybe a token that would incentivize planting trees, right? We have a lot of deforestation. If you design that token in a way, um, uh, the governance of that, the mechanisms behind that token design have to be sophisticated because the last thing you want to do is to have an incentive design that in the long run will have uh, uh, everyone plant trees and then we only have trees all over the world. Like we still need streets and it's, it's a very extreme use case. But so uh, what do you measure, right? And what about the collateral damage if, if the governance rules in your projects are wrong? And getting those impact assessment tools right is, is a very difficult thing in itself. And we're trying to do that. So if anyone wants to collaborate with us, we definitely should talk and are already talking. Uh, how can we make those tools happen? Um, Jason, I w very quickly, I want to ask you, um, from your experience, um, do you think that there are certain regions of the globe that can benefit more than others? I mean, is this something that, that is more for industrial countries or is this something more for, for developing countries? No, no, I'm, to, for us, I mean, one particular region in is Africa is the most obvious, um, the obvious case, and that's where we are, we're putting actually most of our focus. You asked a couple of questions before about when, and for us, we, we intend to launch this fund um, before the end of this year at our general conference. and. Um, and really with the emphasis on piloting in Africa first. So for me, in terms of what is the primary objective, by definition our mandate is to help developing countries, particularly those least developing countries. 
And if you look at traditional finance and an investment, that is not where the money is flowing to. And especially, again, back to the SMEs. 90% of business is SMEs, small, medium enterprises. And they're the ones that we can assist to scale up. And there's a lot of innovation that's going on in some of these continents. So for us, primarily, of course, is Africa. We are operating in uh, many of those regions. But in a nutshell, the focus for us, especially with the achievement of the SDGs, is to, uh, to support those developing countries. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, one last question, one, one I want to also give to, to Human um, is, um, what kind of blockchain are we talking about here? I mean, what kind of technology are you planning on using? Can you talk about that? One. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, we first identified that this I just talked about two small, small issue here around it because we're looking at mobilizing private financing. And one of the things that you find a contradiction here with is, is that what does blockchain achieve? Blockchain achieves what? Low cost, speed, and in terms of transparency. Mm -hmm. When you start to look and talk to fund managers, what are one of the key things that they have is information. And in some way, that's what blockchain will do, will disrupt that. Because blockchain will bring through this level of low cost, speed, transparency. So, for us, at this stage, we are focusing primarily on the impact measurement. It, it comes into what was being mentioned before about measuring and evaluating, and that will be on a private permissioned blockchain. That is our initial focus. And in terms of the technology, us as UN are not innovators per se, but we are working with external partners. Um, we have already started some work with, uh, with the value itself in terms of some of the impact measurement tools that are being established here. So, yeah. Um, Umar, I asked you before, can you talk about the technology that you use? Sure. We use a private parity Ethereum client for our work with proof of authority as the consensus mechanism, uh, which allows us to go quite fast and we don't have the environmental impact as proof of, author, proof of work. And we can do this because we know who the participating nodes in our network are, uh, whereas in many cases you can't. Um, Ethereum, of course, adds a lot of flexibility on top of Bitcoin. And one of the main reasons we chose it in addition to the fact that it has many developers around the world available. But there are many blockchains out there. You know, some have benefits or pros and cons. We haven't reached any limits of the Ethereum mm -hmm. sp sphere to uh, make us think of switching for the moment. But um, as discussed earlier, um, the hardest part is getting people convinced to do this, and then breaking down the business logic into computer code. And once you have the logic clear, in my view at least, a switch in potentially to X technology in five years will not be as drastic. I don't know if many people might remember, or Lotus Notes, that was around that many people, yeah. I do, I'm old. And some people still, <laughs> then it was Outlook, right? And then switching overnight from one to the other. Of course, there are some differences, but once you know what email is, what an email address is, what a subject line means, what an attachment means, it's not as drastic. And this is how I would view potentially switching technologies in the future. Um, one question that came from the audience, and I'm going to shamelessly pluck a couple of questions from this very, very uh, cool tool that we have uh, in work here, um, is did you ever overestimate the impact of tech transformations and the services delivered? Did you? St what are the limitations that you actually came up with? You, you know what I mean? Uh, well, overestimation, I think, uh, no, <laughs> as in, uh, of course I would say that, but uh, I think everything we've said we would achieve that every project plan we have achieved. So we said during this phase, this is what we're going to do, and that's what we've done, and we're going one step at a time. Um, I think sometimes uh, things end up being a hype because nobody acts on them. And we're trying to act on it. I personally really see the value and potential of this technology. And one step at a time, I'm trying to show and, you know, and learn at the same time how this can work and try to go one step forward. Big limitation in our world is smartphone ownership and connectivity, neither of which we can assume for our beneficiaries. And that's massive on, on the blockchain. <laughs> like, that's a big limitation. Um, like a friend that reminded me that he would, you know, somebody asked him to do data analysis without data. It's not maybe, um, <laughs> it's not as drastic, but you know. But if you think of regular, well, cell phones, what they call feature phones now, in the 90s, they were a luxury item, you know, they were expensive, coverage was not good. And now we can assume 
practically every beneficiary we serve has access to at least the SIM card and some kind of a phone. And I think X number of years in the future, and the future is exponential, right? So the rate of change in the next 10 years will not be the same as the past 10 years. Um, so I think connectivity and uh, smartphone ownership will be solved and we're paving the ground to be ready for the moment that that happens and within those limits, we're still trying to do what we can with what is available on the ground. Um, uh, maybe, Julia, can you talk about uh, smartphone ownership in Africa? We talked about Africa before. Is this something that you, that you got on your radar um, or is this something that you just have to you know, work with what you got? Actually, I mean, primarily Unido works with uh, companies, industry mainly, um, but a lot of our uh, technical assistance uh, in, includes trainings and workshops and um, capacity building activities. And with this regard, actually, we are using uh, mobile payments mm -hmm. in Africa quite a lot for the incentive schemes for trainings that we provide. And it's functioning well. and. Uh, uh, It was um, an innovation that actually I worked personally on three years ago in Unido, and um, it's proving very helpful into um, in implementing our operations in uh, really problematic areas in, in Africa where we don't have access to any kind of uh, payment facilities. Um, so I, I saw that, That's, uh, that was I think the beginning and it actually uh, your, your operation in WFP is inspiring to also try and look at the blockchain for uh, maybe evolving this uh, mechanism that we are using. Thank you. Um, do you want to May something? I add a personal assessment to why the double, um, I mean, we met a year ago at a conference in Jordan, and I think one of the reasons this project is so, so successful is because you're driving it. Mainly, no, no, I mean, you need, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you have a lot of collaborators and you wouldn't be able to make it yourself, but uh, what is very essential is that you have somebody who really truly understands what a game-changing aspect this technology is and, um, and uh, really pulls the ship even against odds, right? And uh, many hours of work and um, so I think it takes leadership When we talk about technological transformation, I think you uh, might be a role model and the, the, uh, the, the whole team that is working for you is kind of, a, you, sh you showed leadership, you see that there is a huge problem, there is a huge potential for a certain technology to solve this. And, and uh, against all technological and organizational and political odds, you're trying to make this happen to the point that you're saying you meet all, you met all your deadlines, which is really hard in a, any software project honestly. And so I Or think leadership, project. leadership, like we're talking about technology, but ultimately it's a governance tool and governance also starts with leadership. And uh, it might be a bit contradictory because uh, the idea of Bitcoin was to have money without banks and bank managers and to get rid of human bias because people are corrupt. So that was kind of the, the narrative. But in the end, I think To close with the words I started, technology is a tool and how we use the tool is a personal question and it's also a leadership question and not only of one person but certainly a collective of people. Thank you. I have, uh, I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> I, know, I know how hard yeah. you work. So. <laughs> I only wish uh, my bosses have the same assessments of me as you do but <laughs> thank you so much for that. Well they will after watching the live stream, right? Um, <laughs> It's being recorded. Yeah, absolutely, it's being recorded and live streamed. And <laughs> um, Jürgen, um, we talked about uh, smartphone ownership, um, and I'm not worried about smartphone ownership in Austria, um, but, but we have to ask the questions uh, uh, limitations-wise. We talked about regulation. Um, what about infrastructure? Is this something that we have to, that we have to look, take a good look at um, with, uh, in comparison to, to other countries? Um, and also, and also um, let's call it intellectual infrastructure. We have this institute here, we have people uh, uh, talking here. Where do you think Austria stands in this um, technology um, transformation? Well, that's, that's a good question and, and, and um, I, I think I don't have exact evidence to answer that question. It's, it's rather anecdotal, I would say. I mean, Austrians are said to be quite critical against new technologies and I mean, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion in Austria about the uh, smart meter rollout and 
if, if you have a new technology, which is the basis for energy transition, uh, people usually find thousands of reasons why it's not appropriate uh, to, to rule it out. There are additional costs and, I mean, there are some uh, good reasons to be skeptical, uh, like data security, but I, I'm quite sure that can, that, that can be solved. And I'm, I'm just coming back for a business trip to Denmark, which we had last week, and, and, and that was really interesting to, to look at the Danish approach. I mean, they, they have a consensus in Parliament for energy transition. All the parties subscribe to 100% renewable electricity production in 2030, net zero emission in 2050, and, and I find that much more complicated in Austria. But saying that, I mean, what we really need, to, the trick we need to, I mean, as an administration, we are not edge of science. We are we're just following, try to, to, to translate scientific findings into evidence-based policy making. But we, what, what we really also try to do um, to, uh, to, to, to tell the story about combating climate change in a different way. I mean, it's also a case of, you know, innovating, investing, and, and we are now having a program for sustainable investment in Austria. And, and the, the interesting thing about that story is that you get different allies from the more traditional environmentalists, but you really, you really get interest by, by, by young businesses. And that's exactly the way to do, to, to, um, um, to have a, a positive vision which is, of course, technology-driven, and technology won't do the whole job, but it will be a, a central, a central piece for the transformation. Um, you, you talked about Denmark. How, how much of this can actually be done on a national level? I mean, you know, re rearranging the energy grid and the energy production on a national level does it even make sense in in uh, in this day and age, compared to the European level? I think you need both. I think. Uh, it's often used as an excuse that you say, well, on a national level, we can't do so much and we have European regulations. But, but if, you look, if you look at the energy transition, there are so many different speeds in Europe. And, and they are front runners and they manage and they have the same European regulation as Poland, who has, you know, 85% coal in, in electricity production. So there is a lot of flexibility, but, uh, but by no means, uh, we, we don't want to be an, how is it called in English, an island of the saints. I mean, in, in, in particular in the energy fields, we are living in a, in a liberal, liberalized market, and which is good because it brings down cost by the end of the day. It also provides flexibility, but we still can be and should manage to be a front runner because we are talking about technological development and, and those who are uh, at, at the edge of the development who are leading, I mean, uh, will at the end of the day uh, be successful in business and make the bargain. So it's, it's rather good to be a front runner to, than, than lagging behind. Um, I, I want to ask you two, uh, who are the front runners outside of Europe when, when it comes to, to te technology adoption? Where, where do you see the most promising um, technology, the most promising projects, companies um, working with blockchain? I mean, if, before you ask me about where to go and if you look, there are some big success stories that you're already seeing in Africa. I mean, if we look at uh, Rwanda as being, which is predominantly basing its whole industrial strategy around being, becoming a tech hub. Ghana, etc. So there's some real forefronters already out there in Africa. Senegal is now coming through strong as one of the Francophile countries. So those are the areas that we're seeing um, that are actually demonstrating. Ethiopia as well as a success story is phenomenal at the moment. But actually coming back a little bit from what you said is that it's actually essential is not only in terms of the innovation but it's the infrastructure that needs to be in there you know, in order to be able to have the connectivity. A small, medium enterprise, it's a must, that they must have a level of connectivity. Mm -hmm. That's a given. But it then also comes back up to the national level where you look at those governments and what is the strategy that they're putting in place to enable that to happen. <laughs> and those are some of the examples, certainly, that we have, we have been working with in Unido in, uh, in the last year or so, and primarily we're focusing, and it's getting national ownership of that, A, industrial strategy, and underlying that, how can you best leverage innovation, whether that be around blockchain or other technologies by artificial intelligence, et cetera. 
would you say it's easier to work with the Rwandan government or the Austrian government? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not a good question after a phone call I had about an hour ago with, uh, the, with the city of Vienna, but <laughs> I, I, you know, it, it is interesting, is this, you, you look at, and I guess from also from WFP, you, two angles, there's those who give and those where you go to, you know, so in terms of the traditional donors and the recipients. So normally it's easier where you go, because there you can see that people the benefits of the support that you're trying to provide to the country. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, you have to support your, uh, your donors, in particular your host country. So, rather a neutral answer, but it's a neutral it focus, more on the, <laughs> focus more on the beneficiary, because that's, at the end of the day, that's what our mandate is, so. Um, have you seen, and I want to ask this question, I want to start with you, maybe, maybe Julia. Um, have you seen a, um, um, a shift of, of, of um, attitude and expectations when it comes to this technology um, that goes hand in hand with the development of the, 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 the crypto markets that we don't want to talk about today or not too much? But what I'm asking is from a, from a media point of view, it always, everything just goes with the hype, right? So is it easier to work on the top of a hype, or is it easier to work when the hype is, is slowing down? It's a very good question. I mean, uh, you know that uh, the UN is slow in adapting and changing. I've heard so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can confirm that. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, we started uh, looking into actually more financing innovation. That was our primary goal and uh, to maximize the impact of our programs. And last year we organized a workshop. And that's where we came about uh, learning about all these uh, technologies that, and what is the actual benefit that they can bring into our, our way of operating. And uh, we learned about other cases in the UN system. And um, we are a small team now. Uh, pioneering this idea of using blockchain to measure and report and verify the impact of our projects. And we really hope that this will be uh, just the first pilot project in UNIDO on how we can use um, blockchain. Have, have other UN um, um, agencies you know, called you up and said, what are you doing there? T tell me about it. Yes, we collaborate a lot. There's an innovation um, network in the UN, and our project will actually, was actually selected, and we will be participating in the um, innovation lab of uh, WFP in, uh, in Munich. So um, we are definitely cooperating and sharing knowledge uh, within the UN system on how we can best uh, utilize this, uh, this technology, also because it, the knowledge is not in-house, so we must learn, cooperate with other UN agencies that are using it already, and also we have to rely on the private sector to assist us in uh, how to best uh, approach this. Um, thank you very much. Um, Shamin, one of the questions that, that I actually for all of you um, from the audience is how would you all join forces after leaving this conference to accelerate positive impact through tech? And I want to add something what I asked uh, before, do you, you've been in this game for a, quite a long time. Is it easier to work, you know, do serious work in, ti in, 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 in the times of the so-called crypto winter? Or is it easier when everybody is on it and there is like a, an event every night and everybody is hyped? Well, actually, it's not a crypto winter. It's just an investor's crypto winter. From an investor's you said, perspective. You said Bitcoin, Bitcoin was supposed to be the new money and I, I thought, great, now nobody has money, money anymore. Uh, when did I say that? No, no, yeah, yeah. before, okay. whatever. Um, the new money. Um, no, it's uh, definitely much easier for us, at least, uh, when we started last year this institute. Um, it was just uh, at the peak of the uh, Bitcoin price and um, uh, the, 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 the prices of a lot of those tokens or cryptocurrencies uh, being traded. Um, that was quite difficult for us because uh, the media attention that we got, including from you, was uh, always uh, regarding Bitcoin. And we always tried to say, listen, Bitcoin is just the token of a payment network, and the payment network is a public good, and that's the interesting part, the governance mechanism behind it. That's the interesting part, but the media was not interested. So in, because that doesn't sell, uh, and uh, for most cases, <laughs> Um, uh, 
so what I find very good now is because the prices are down and also time has passed, so two, two components came here together. Um, as, uh, as time passes, people understand better the full extent of what actually this technology is about. And uh, the, this so-called crypto winter actually helps. I don't see it as a winter because now that it's maturing and then more knowledge is maturing, we finally get to do stuff. And uh, as you can see from the turnout of this conference, uh, the interest is quite big. Uh, we uh, promoted this conference before uh, uh, the Presse uh, Inserat last week went out. We already had almost 500 people signed up based on two social media announcements that we made. So obviously, I mean, we're very good in social media, we have a lot of followership, but obviously the interest is very, very big in spite of the prices on the markets because people understand that the underlying technology is decoupled from uh, somewhat decoupled from certain token prices. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would, I would agree that the media is to blame, almost almost always, but um, the media is not to blame probably for climate change, and we talked about crypto winter, um, and there is a question, there is a question um, uh, from the audience, um, and it's to all of you, so please uh, feel free to answer. Um, the biggest change ahead is climate change, so we heard that. Um, the IPCC says we'll reach a 1.5 to 2 degrees um, in 10 to 30 years with all, con uh, all its consequences, and that's a qu good question. Will the blockchain technology development actually be fast enough to have an impact before we do that? Who wants to you know, look into the future? Please. I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> I, and I wouldn't answer this from blockchain as the technology, but what it can bring, and it comes back to what you mentioned before in the Paris Agreement, the ability to measure and be able to see that we are reaching those targets. And I'm sorry, we do not have those tools so readily available today. Yes. And that for me is where blockchain is absolutely essential. Whether it be climate change, I go back to the SDGs, gender equality, decent jobs, that's what I think it can bring. I'm convinced that there are enough people out there in the, techno in the technology world who can ensure that it is much more climate efficient, so to speak, than it was a few years ago. Things are improving, but I think that's for me is really what it brings, certainly to us in, uh, in, in the UN. Thank you. I fully agree. Transparency is key. I think most people are very frustrated every time we buy something in the supermarket, online, every time we take the plane uh, or we step in the car, we know that we're somehow negatively impacting something and we don't know exactly how and what. So uh, if Changers, for example, is still out there, they have this app that tracks how much, what is your CO2 footprint of a lot of activities that you do, but they also do much more. And so, um, and those apps and tools have been out there, but blockchain definitely is a technology that can bring us a radical level of transparency that for the first time will allow us to have more educated decisions about what we buy and what we do and uh, or what we produce and also who we collaborate with on a business level when we decide to collaborate with someone. So transparency is key and we haven't had that transparency. Uh, I just want to add, I mean, I, I cannot answer the question. I mean, what I can say is, I mean, we have seen the special report by IPCC, which was issued last October, which made it very clearly that there's a huge difference between a 1.5 average global warming and 2 degrees. Unfortunately, we're on a tra 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 trajectory to 3 degrees warming. Uh, if you if you look at the collective national determined contribution, which are the backbone of the Paris Agreement, we know what we need to do more. I mean, if you look at the IPCC report, it provides some uh, techno technological answers, but I guess it won't be only the techno technological challenges which we are facing. We are facing challenges in terms of governance, of decision making, and there is something where we need also new technology and, 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 and new thoughts, and well, I'm quite convinced that um, such technologies can play can play a, a large role. If it's fast enough, I merely don't know. Um, let me 
two or maximum three questions, um, and then we, we wrap it up. Um, human, one question from the audience that, that is, should be very specific. Um, we talked about impact measurement uh, today uh, via blockchain. So what, what do you and your project actually actually do um, to quantify the efficiency gained with blockchain? How, how, what what you know, data are you looking at? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, the, one of the, I think, problems with evaluation is that people then tend to focus on easily measurable metrics, like cost savings and everything. And we've done that. In Jordan, we've saved uh, $700,000 since the project launched. And, um, you know, we've reduced risk measurably by not advancing money anymore. We used to advance it. Uh, we've improved data protection because we don't share any information before we use. So these are easy to measure, but I think there's also some, you know, uh, on what more difficult to measure param parameters in there um, that uh, I think should be the part of the equation. So short answer is on, on the parts that we can uh, quantify, we measure, and on every metric that we do measure, we've made an improvement. But um, I think that shouldn't be the sole focus because then it might incentive or it might not put as much emphasis on some of the more important stuff like collaboration, which initially might be hard to put a number on it. But I think eventually, once you do have the full collaboration and you do optimization and harmonizations, then you could have significant impacts on the thing. But that also, uh, we do have a very strong monitoring and evaluation, at least as uh, in so far as nutrition goes for our beneficiaries. So, um, and we are actually working uh, with academics from a couple of universities, uh, in particular for the pilot that we're going to launch with UN Women to do a baseline study um, for some more qualitative stuff, like the, woman, the ladies who are participating, their sense of empowerment within the family, all sorts of different metrics. Um, they're being looked at academically, but it's a bit too soon to, um, to say because the pilot hasn't launched yet, at mm -hmm. least not with the one with the UN Women. Yeah. Thank you very much. Shamin, I want to give you the last question, and it's, I think it's an important one. It's in about incentive structures. Um, and you, I think you do a lot of work here about incentive structures. And uh, there's a reason, um, and I want to explain this as, as neutral as possible, but there's a reason why the media concentrates on you know, a big thing like the Bitcoin price, right? And the reason is the readers want to, want to concentrate on that because the readers want to get rich. So they have an incentive to read the stories, and we have an incentive to report them. Um, so how, how, how is it possible with, with blockchain to change incentive structures to, 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 to you know, make people do good, to help with reaching uh, the development goals, to help with, with, um, with their own money or their own life? Okay, um, I did address this in uh, the opening this morning, but maybe not everyone was here. So I think what Bitcoin has showed us, Bitcoin uh, is not, is the token is, has similarities to something we could call a currency, but uh, the raison d'etre for Bitcoin is the peer-to-peer -peer payment network and the incentive mechanism um, and the peer-to-peer -peer payment network, it's a public good that is open and permissionless for anyone to use. And it's the management and upkeep of that payment network is fully decentralized and it's incentivized with a token. When you contribute work, to the system, um, you get incentivized, I mean, super simplified, you get incentivized with a network token. So the incentive to create collectively, collaboratively create that public good is to be selfish. Mm -hmm. So, and, um, and we can now take this principle and many projects, uh, some of which we saw today, have been taking this to create not peer-to-peer -peer money, but peer-to-peer -peer computing, as in the case of Ethereum, or peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, rendering, or, um, and, and these public goods are collective, kind of like you're incentivized to create, collectively create a public good. And we have a different type of incentive to uh, incentivize people to reduce externalities to a public good, <laughs> like air pollution by when you prove that you have uh, reduced CO2 emission reduction, you are incentivized. Now the principle is not new, nudging, etc. We've had that, even though uh, nudging is not that old as a principle itself either. Uh, but the, uh, the technology that we have, the public infrastructure and the easiness of creating a token with a few lines of code and having it run on a publicly verifiable infrastructure, that is revolutionary and it is as revolutionary as creating websites 
in the 1990s because the internet existed before HTML and the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. But only people who could code could access information on the internet. And it really became a big thing when people could create visual websites and tokens are an equivalent to blockchain. And these incentive tokens are something that allow us to collectively create public good. But the question of how the exact governance mechanism is steered is a complex one, is, an, is related to impact and to complexity theory. And uh, I think the only way to resolve this is by approaching this in an interdisciplinary manner. And that is quite a challenge, as we can see from the one and a half years that we've been running this institute. But it's possible, apparently. So. We're getting there. Thank you very much, Shamin. Um, I've gotten a personal uh, message a couple of minutes ago. Um, somebody texted because I said I, I actually came here with the car and when I can do I can, can I uh, earn tokens. Turns out there is an app called Changes CO2 Fit app um, that is already there. I can they tell me I can uh, walk, cycle, or use public transport on my way home to get tokens. That's great. Um, I'm pretty sure that I don't get enough tokens to pay for the uh, garage here at VU um, to uh, park my car overnight. But next time I will actually. Uh, I will definitely try that. I want to thank um, everybody on the, uh, all our, our panelists. I want to thank all the speakers of this, um, I think, very productive conference today. Um, I think you mentioned that we're going to do this probably next year, um, so we can also measure the impact of the conference at some point. Um, thank you, Shermi. Thank, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody um, in the audience, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.